Hello wonderful people, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my cardiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about clinically oriented anatomy of the thorax. We talked about physiology of the heart, as well as cardiac pharmacology. Then we started talking about pathology. We can classify heart diseases any way we want. We can classify them anatomically. For example, disease of the endocardium, disease of the myocardium, and disease of the pericardium. We can also divide them as ischemic heart diseases, congenital heart diseases, infectious heart diseases, neoplastic heart diseases, and much more. And we talked about rheumatic fever in its own video and infective endocarditis on a separate occasion. Today, it's time to compare between rheumatic fever and infective endocarditis. This one is caused as a reaction to only one bacteria, which is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, also known as streptococcus pyogenes. But infective endocarditis could be caused by many bacteria and many fungi. So click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This is my cardiology playlist. Please try to watch these videos in order. Here's my endocardium, myocardium, and pericardium from the inside out. Which layer contains the cardiac valves? Answer, endocardium. Infective endocarditis affects the endocardium, including the valves. As for rheumatic fever, it also involves the endocardium, but not just the endocardium. Rheumatic fever can have pancarditis, endocardium, myocardium, and pericardium. Since both diseases can affect my endocardium, can they cause cardiac valvular murmurs? Yes, indeed. First, let's review rheumatic fever. Then, we'll review infective endocarditis. Then, we'll compare between the two. Rheumatic fever. Why call it rheumatic fever? Because we have joint disease. In fact, more patients with rheumatic fever have joint symptoms than cardiac symptoms. Rheumatic fever. Doodle with medicosis. We have a child, usually between 5 years and 15 years old, developed sore throat or pharyngitis. After this, we wait about 2 to 4 weeks. This kid did not receive antibiotics for the pharyngitis, by the way. After 2 to 4 weeks, an immunological reaction happens. We call it molecular mimicry. Here is the story. M protein or matrix protein belongs to group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. My body was supposed to attack the M protein that belongs to the bacteria. But since the M protein looks very similar to proteins in my heart and to proteins on my neurons, what happened is that my immune system started attacking my own heart and my own neurons. And if this was not bad enough, I also started attacking my own joints and my own skin. And I get the Jones criteria. J, joint disease, usually polyarthritis. It's migratory. First it hits, let's say, the knee, then the hip, then it leaves and goes to the elbow, then it leaves and goes to the shoulder, etc. Many joints, polyarthritis. And after it goes away, it does not leave permanent deformity or permanent damage behind. As for the O, it looks like a heart, so it is carditis. Pancarditis, so I have endocarditis, myocarditis, and pericarditis. Then I have the N, subcutaneous nodules. Then I have the E, erythema marginatum. And the S is for Sydenham chorea, also known as St. Vitus Dance. If you want to learn more about Sydenham's chorea, I have a separate video on this topic. You can find it in my neurology playlist. Please remember that in rheumatic fever, the original infection was a bacterial infection in my throat, not on my skin. Two to four weeks after the pharyngitis, I started to develop the signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever, including what's in the Jones criteria. Joint problems, carditis, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginata, and Sydenham's chorea. You can download these colorful notes at medicosisperfectionatus.com. I help you understand and pass exams. Rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever happens to young people, 5 to 15 years old. Especially if I'm living in a crowded area, especially if I'm living in poverty. And then, 2 to 4 weeks later, type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, I get acute rheumatic fever. Recurrence again and again and again can make it chronic. Remember that acute causes regurgitation murmur, but chronic is stenotic. Chronic is stenotic. Chronic is stenotic. 
Then I have my Jones criteria again. We have major criteria and minor criteria. Major criteria are the ones that you know. Joint disease, carditis, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, and Sydenham's chorea. How do we diagnose rheumatic fever? Clinically by the Jones criteria. I need one major criteria and two minor criteria, or simply two major. So two major criteria or one major and two minor. What are the minor Jones criteria? High ESR, high CRP, fever, joint pain, increased neutrophilic count, prolonged PR interval on ECG, and previous rheumatic fever. If I do chest x-ray, I see cardiomegaly or enlarged cardiac silhouette. If I do echo, I see the valvular heart disease. Acute is regurgitant, chronic is thenotic. Don't forget anti-ASO and anti-DNAs B antibodies, which tell me about group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Post-mortem biopsy or autopsy will show what? It will show Ashoff bodies. What kind of necrosis is this? Fibrinoid necrosis surrounded by NHK cells. What are these? Good old reactive histiocytes. Reactive macrophages. How do I prevent rheumatic fever? Nip it in the bud. Treat the pharyngitis early on by penicillin before you wait two to four weeks after this and develop rheumatic fever. Let's say that rheumatic fever is already here. How can I manage it? Antibiotics, usually long term, we go with penicillin. What if I'm allergic to penicillin? Go with erythromycin. A characteristic of this joint disease that its pain resolves on taking aspirin. And for the carditis, glucocorticoids might help. Why? Because they are anti-inflammatory. Next, let's review infective endocarditis. Inflammation of the endocardium and the valves. Endocarditis could be infective, could be non-infective, as we have discussed before in my video titled Endocarditis. Today we're talking about infective endocarditis. They could be caused by any infective agent, more commonly bacteria, of course, followed by fungi. Viruses and parasites are very rare. Bacterial endocarditis. What's the difference between acute bacterial endocarditis and subacute bacterial endocarditis? Well, if the bacteria is super duper strong, i.e. high virulence, and my heart valve was healthy before the infection, and suddenly the bacteria came and destroyed the valve very quickly. This is acute because the bacteria is so strong, and even if the valve is healthy, the bacteria will destroy it. But what if my valve had a problem? It will destroy it too. It was so strong acute, such as the nasty Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus can also do it, and Haemophilus influenzae. As for the subacute, it's a weaker bacteria, lower virulence, attacking a weak valve, such as very dense group Streptococci, including Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus mitis, the HASIC group Streptococcus bovis, currently known as Streptococcus galuliticus, Enterococci, and sometimes Staph aureus again. If you want to learn about all of these bacteria, please check out my microbiology playlist. We have talked about them in detail. If I have infective endocarditis, I will develop vegetations on my valves. Vegetations are made of what? They are made of the pathogen, such as bacteria or fungi, and they have platelets and fibrin. These vegetations can damage my valve, not just the valve leaflets, but the corda tendony as well, leading to murmur, usually regurgitation murmur, because you damage the corda tendony of the valve. This is similar to the damage of the corda tendony that happens post myocardial infarction, which also leads to a regurgitation murmur, such as mitral regurgitation. Since these are infected foci, they can spread, leading to bacteremia and or pyemia. What's pyemia? Never ever say this is pus in the blood. Nonsense. There is no such thing as pus floating in the blood. It is a septic focus or a septic embolus floating in the blood. Once the septic embolus hits another organ, it will create an abscess there. The pus will be at the organ, not in the blood. So I can develop abscess in my lungs, lung abscess. How about empyema? It can happen to brain abscess. Why not? Vertebral osteomyelitis. It can happen. Just like pot disease of tuberculosis? Exactly. If you want to see more cardiology videos, drop a heart emoji in the comments. So here is infective endocarditis, here is my heart, the endocardium has the valves. Could be that I have healthy valve, or could be that I had damaged valve from a previous disease. And then what? I'm immunocompromised, or 
I had a dental procedure with poor dentition and poor oral hygiene. Or I had a prosthetic valve. Or I have an indwelling catheter. Could be intravenous catheter or could be urinary catheter. All of these are sources of bacterial invasion of the blood. Before you know it, the bacteria are now on my valves, causing the vegetations, which contain the pathogens such as bacteria or fungi, platelets, and fibrin. They damage the valve, they damage the leaflets of the valve, they damage the cord tendony, until I end up with regurgitation murmurs, such as mitral regurgitation, or tricuspid regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, etc. All of this will give me what? This will give me a murmur. A murmur that did not exist before. So, new regurgitation murmur. Amazing, what else? This is infection, right? Do we expect fever? Absolutely. So, fever plus new murmur equals infective endocarditis. The patient is usually between 40 and 65, but it can happen in any age. Then all of this can spread to the blood, causing septic embolization, lung abscess, brain abscess, vertebral osteomyelitis, etc. I can also have immunological phenomena besides the embolic phenomena. So I get glomerulonephritis. I develop petechia on my skin. I get splinter hemorrhage, Osler nodules, and Janeway lesions. I get Roth spots on my retina, etc., etc., etc. All of these are symptoms of infective endocarditis. The most common organisms that cause infective endocarditis are staphylococci and streptococci. Those are bacteria, of course, and the most common fungus is candida. If the question tells you that the patient has history of dental procedures with poor dentition and poor oral hygiene, think very dense group streptococcus as the cause of the infective endocarditis. This is a big group of bacteria, not just one bacterium. What are these bacteria? They have many names. Here are just two, Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus mitis. If the question told you that the patient has history of intravenous drug abuse, think Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas, Candida, and Enterococci, but Staph aureus is the most common. If the question said artificial heart valve, well, if it's early on, i.e. less than 60 days after receiving the new valve, think Staph epidermidis and others. If it happened more than 60 days after receiving the valve, think Staph aureus. How about nosocomial in the hospital? I have an intravenous catheter, think Staph aureus. Here's intravenous drug abuse and here's intravenous catheter. Staph aureus once again. Then, if it's an indwelling urinary catheter in the hospital, think enterococcus. If I have colon ulceration, whether it's from an ulcerative colitis or from cancer, Think Streptococcus bovis, now called Streptococcus gelolyticus. If I am very immunocompromised, chronic indwelling catheter, prolonged antibiotic therapy, it could be a fungus. All of these organisms will show up on blood culture. However, some organisms are very difficult to culture by ordinary media. And these will be culture-negative infective endocarditis, such as the infamous HASIC group, which is an acronym. Haemophilus, Aggregatibacter, Cardiobacterium ominis, Echinella, and Kingella. Then I have Aspergillus, as well as Coxiella burnetti, Brucella, Bertinella, Chlamydia, Sitaki, Legionella, and Trifurima whipplei. So, infective endocarditis, the patient is between 40 and 65. Here are the risk factors. Don't forget IV drug abuse and the indwelling catheters, as well as congenital heart disease. Fever and no regurgitating murmur equals infective endocarditis until proven otherwise. Wide blood cell count is high. I have fatigue, joint pain, Roth spots in the retina, glomerulonephritis in the kidney, petechiae on the skin, then splinter hemorrhage, Janeway lesions, and Osler nodes on my skin and nails, infarctions of many organs, septic emboli, splenomegaly can happen, and neurological symptoms. You diagnose it clinically by the modified Duke's criteria. You order blood culture, not just one, but three to five sets of blood cultures. You do EKG, you do echo to look at the valvular heart disease and the vegetations. How can I treat it? Empirically, before the culture results come back, we give vancomycin, you can give penicillin, you can give ceftriaxone plus gentamicin, depending on the circumstances. But once the culture comes back, you treat the organism. If it's candida, treat the candida. If it's viridans, you treat the viridans, etc. If it's culture-negative infective endocarditis, give me something broad-spectrum. 
ampicillin and gentamicin together. Very important, this combo. Gentamicin, the gentleman. Not really, because he can destroy my kidneys and my ears. Nephrotoxic and ototoxic. It's one of the aminoglycosides. And here are the modified Duke's criteria. We have major positive blood culture and positive echo finding for the vegetations on my valves. And the minor criteria are fever, predisposing lesion, IV drug abuse, embolic phenomena, or immunological phenomena. To definitively say that I have infective endocarditis, you need the two major criteria or one major plus three minor. Now to the comparison, rheumatic fever versus infective endocarditis. The cause here is just one bacterium only, which is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. It's not the bacteria per se, it's an immunological reaction against the bacterial M protein that happens two to four weeks after the strep throat. As for the infective endocarditis, it's not a reaction to one organism. We have gazillion organisms, Staph aureus, the Verdans, the Enterococci, the Bovis, and the Candida among others. If it's culture negative, don't forget the HASIC. Epidemiology, the patient is between 5 to 15 if we're talking acute traumatic fever, but the patient is older in infective endocarditis. Risk factors for rheumatic fever, living in poverty, crowded areas, and being young. For infective endocarditis, having a weak valve from a congenital heart disease or having an artificial valve or an indwelling catheter or being a drug user. Clinically speaking, a rheumatic fever, pharyngitis, then two to four weeks later, I develop the Jones criteria, joint, carditis, nodules, erythema marginatum, Sydenham's chorea. As for the infective endocarditis, I get fever and murmur. Fever, fever and murmur, murmur and fever. Fever plus no murmur equals infective endocarditis. Embolic phenomena, immunological phenomena, and here are they. You diagnose rheumatic fever by the Jones criteria, but you diagnose infective endocarditis by the modified Dukes criteria. Here I need two major or one major plus two minor, but here I need two major or one major plus three minor. You treat rheumatic fever with penicillin. That's easy. If I'm allergic to penicillin, give me erythromycin. As for infective endocarditis, first you draw the cultures, three to five. And then what? Then you treat me empirically with vancomycin or penicillin or ampicillin plus gentamicin. And then after the culture results come back, you give me the antibiotic that will specifically target the bacteria of concern. Would you like to learn more about penicillins, cephalosporins, estriunam, carbapenems, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, etc.? You can download my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It will teach you about the antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. To learn about the different types of shock, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, etc., download my surgery high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. To learn about angina, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, ARDS, diabetic ketoacidosis, and more, download my emergency medicine high yields. And to learn about the antiarrhythmics, antihypertensives, digoxin, and diuretics, download my cardiac pharmacology course. There are more than 300 premium videos available on this channel, only to those who click the join button and choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.